Hello and welcome to our special series, Keeping It Simple, where we break down the most complex news stories and make sense of them. On the program today, we continue to look at the aftermath of the removal of Article 370 in Jammu and Kashmir. Today we ask, what are the four things that Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister, got right and wrong in his handling of Article 370 and Jammu and Kashmir? Let's first start with the four things that he got right. The Prime Minister and the Home Minister definitely read the national mood correctly. We have seen even those who did not vote for Narendra Modi, even those who are not fans of the BJP, actually coming out across ideological affiliations in much of mainland India to support the Prime Minister's decision. This means that what was once an issue for the core base of the BJP and was essentially an RSS Sangh project has been successfully mainstreamed by the BJP into a national issue. The framing of the issue as one nation, one law really did seem to catch on with people. And we have therefore seen even parties like the Congress thrown into major confusion. You've seen leaders like Jyotiraditya Sindhya and Milind Diora breaking ranks with the party position and actually taking a different position to support the government move. You've seen Nitish Kumar do a U-turn on his initial opposition. You've seen Arvind Kejriwal, otherwise the bitter critic of the BJP, realizing that there are elections coming up in the national capital and he has to be in sync with the national mood. So the one thing that the BJP uh, and Mr. Modi have got right was their sense that this would be a major win for them on domestic national politics. When it comes to Jammu and Kashmir, here's the second thing that Narendra Modi has got right. I think the BJP is correct in arguing that the status quo in Jammu and Kashmir had to be smashed. It was jaded, it was stale, uh, it was not working and all of the old slogans uh, had in fact uh, maybe become redundant. The National Conference, the slogan of greater autonomy, uh, Mehbooba Mufti's party had the slogan of a self-rule and uh, you know you had none of these slogans actually translating into something tangible and accessible. So much so that when I was in Srinagar I met a supporter of Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani, the pro-Pakistan Horiyat Conference representative and on the way back on the flight to Delhi this supporter of uh, Mr. Gilani told me that, you know, it's it, the fig leaf, the fig leaf of the mainstream Kashmiri politicians has, has been removed. Now let's see what happens. In other words, there's a widespread acceptance that Article 370 was more symbolic and that it had already been egregiously eroded by Ironically, Congress governments over the years, so much so that today 260 articles of the Indian constitution already applied uh, to Jammu and Kashmir. So I think the BJP had the right instinct in saying that, look, uh, status quo isn't working. In fact, Kashmir uh, was, I would count it as one of Mr. Modi's uh, policy failures in his first term. So the sense that it needs a new idea, that premise, I think is the correct premise. It's a different debate whether he came up with the right answer, but the premise is something he got right. The third thing the Prime Minister got right was in his messaging to Donald Trump. Perhaps what the BJP was thinking of uh, and was an old time BJP project uh, was in fact triggered and catalyzed by Donald Trump's Suomoto uh, offer to mediate on, on, on Jammu and Kashmir uh, and then even claiming that the Prime Minister had asked him to do so, flying in the face of years of stated uh, Indian policy and that this happened while Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan was sitting by his side obviously angered India. India understands that for Trump the priority is to get his troops, at least half of those American troops out of Afghanistan ahead of his own bid for re-election uh, next year and that's his priority. He doesn't, he's willing to prioritize Pakistan, uh, willing to play that game as he enters the Afghanistan end game and I think there Narendra Modi uh, did get uh, his messaging to the world right, his messaging to America right that look you wanted to mediate here is our answer. You do not have space uh, in this equation. The fourth message uh, that has worked from the government has been the message to Pakistan. Uh, the fact, uh, no matter where you stand on whether 370 should have been removed or not removed, what its symbolic value is, what the historicity of the issue is, Pakistan has actually tied itself up in knots with how it's reacted, uh, sending the Indian envoy uh, back home, downgrading diplomatic relations, closing the Wagha border, because how does it get out of this? Uh, you have Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi saying if India takes back its decision on 370, all of this uh, can change. But the fact is that unless there's a different decision from the Supreme Court, that's not going to happen. So you have even mainstream Kashmiri politicians like Shah Faisal arguing uh, to us that 
Pakistan's done the Kashmiris no favor. And to that extent, India's very calm, very measured response uh, to Pakistan uh, after they've downgraded diplomatic relations, I think, has been the right messaging. So those are the four things that the Prime Minister's got right in his, maybe his messaging, in his calculation, in his assumptions. What are the four things he's got wrong? Well, I think the one thing where the messaging has been awry has been the sheer unilateralism of this decision. It's true that strong leaders take tough decisions and everyone's not a consensus builder and you can't always build consensus. But in a democracy, you do at least create the impression of seeking a consensus, of allowing the other voices to speak even if you eventually disregard them. So for example, the debate that took place in parliament after Amit Shah, the Home Minister's announcement that 370 was going, could have taken place before. The country could have witnessed one month long, robust set of conversations in parliament. You could have had, uh, uh, you know, the Jammu and Kashmir uh, politicians of Jammu, Ladakh and Kashmir at that point expressing their uh, uh, point of view and then the BJP could have taken whatever decision uh, it wanted to. And I think that that would have made a lot of difference uh, in, 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 the, in the perception of the manner in which this decision has been taken. The second thing that I believe that the government has got wrong is in the information blockade it has imposed on Jammu and Kashmir. It is no good saying in a televised uh, address or otherwise to the people that we're doing this for you, uh, that 370 has been used to blackmail you, that 370 did not improve your lives. Maybe so, but then if cable channels are down, if phone lines are down, if internet lines are snapped, if people can't talk to each other, there is really something that doesn't add up in your offering a new beginning for Jammu and Kashmir when most of the Kashmir Valley in particular is under this information lockdown. In the past, when we have seen eruptions of, of violence, of militancy, uh, I have, as a reporter in Jammu and Kashmir, understood the need to shut down social media. I have understood that social media can be weaponized uh, by militant groups, by terror outfits. But in the present situation where you yourself are saying that things in Jammu and Kashmir are in control, that a kind of tenuous piece is holding, how do you justify uh, keeping these information lines down. The fourth thing that Narendra Modi, uh, I believe the Prime Minister has, go has got wrong is the weakening of mainstream Kashmiri politicians. At the end of it, Article 370 was the cover, uh, was the respectable argument that could be presented by mainstream politicians to those who were separatists, to those who were insurgents. These were people, whether it was Umar Abdullah or Mehbooba Mufti, Sajad Loon or Imran Ansari or Asha Faisal, who stood for the Indian flag, whose party workers, party cadres have often paid for their lives uh, to take part in Indian elections. Sajad Loon used to be a separatist. He was a separatist and he, he was the first separatist to actually fight a proxy election way back in 2002. He was considered close to the BJP and even somebody like him has been detained. Now, officials argue this is for the, their own good. These are leaders who don't want to face the public right now. But why have we left the mainstream leaders in a position where they are unable uh, to face the public? The, the fact is that if, as the Prime Minister said in his televised address, you want to create a new generation of Kashmiri leaders, you want to get rid of dynastic politics, you want to get rid of family fiefdoms, fair enough. But what is the signal you're sending? The signal you're sending is that mainstream elected representatives can be detained at will and are not allowed a voice in the system. And also, what is the new set of issues that they're going to fashion for themselves? Can you really erase the historicity of this issue? The history of Jammu and Kashmir tells us that every time a government in New Delhi, and the Congress has made this mistake as well, well before the BJP, has not engaged with the moderates, you have only ended up strengthening the extremists. And that brings us to the fourth thing that the Prime Minister has got wrong. When you take, uh, make as cataclysmic a change as you've made uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, when you remove something, you replace it with something. And the one thing that data shows us is that the problem in Jammu and Kashmir is not economic. It's not about jobs. I have personally interviewed the families of highly educated, relatively economically uh, well-off men who picked up the gun and in fact became, uh, became terrorists. I have in, one of them was a school topper, uh, another of them, uh, Zakir Musa, who's still alive and in fact his affiliations with the Al-Qaeda was sent away by his family to study at Punjab University. He still became a militant, he still became a, uh, became a terrorist. So when, you, when the replacement narrative you offer is that there's going to be economic development 
coming into Kashmir. There are going to be investor summits. There are going to be hotels and hospitals and, and private colleges opening. That is, that is utopian and it's theoretical. Because the fact is that till the situation actually improves on the ground, till there is a semblance of peace, you're not going to have uh, non-state residents actually going there and buying land. Even people from Jammu at the moment or Kashmiri Pandits are not going home. So why will anyone else from any other part of the country, there has to be a sense of security, there has to be a sense of uh, a sustainable peace. And we also have to understand that the insurgency is not rooted in economic factors. So the economic factors cannot be cannot be your only response. It can be one in a set of responses. So my sense was that if there was the premise that the status quo is not working, the status quo should have had an alternative narrative uh, in place. And uh, instead, what we have seen is a great degree of triumphalism from the core supporters of the BJP that has often been mocking and jeering and has in fact left out Kashmiris from uh, this dialogue wherein one taxi driver in Srinagar told me, is it that you just want our land and not the people? So these are the four things I believe the Prime Minister got right and the four things the Prime Minister got wrong. How much of this do you agree or disagree with? We welcome your comments as we continue to keep it simple.